tonight, I, had a, I was going to continue on in Jonah, and God changed the message. And he, he wants us to go. And I've done this before. I've been in these verses before, but not like this. And since we've been doing this 21 days of fasting and prayer, there was one day that captured my heart. There was a day in this that God really spoke to me. And uh, we're going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 7. And I know many of us are familiar, my people who will humble themselves and pray. And, but we're going to be looking at this, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11. And <clears throat> here, here's, I want you to, to picture this. We sung a song from the cross to creation, from creation to the cross. That's what it was talking about. I want you to remember that. There's a reason why, you, when you read the Old Testament, there's a reason why God just wouldn't let Israel get away with anything. There's a reason why, because that's why we have such a precious grace today. You get that? If God would have just overlooked, and listen, church, I'm talking to you. <laughs> you listen to me. I know you want to love everybody. You want to help everybody. But listen, Jesus is the only one that can help people. You need to stop trying to be a savior, and you need to be a servant. We need to be careful, because if you get in the way, you're going to diminish grace. You're going to mess it up. That's the reason God, the nation of Israel had to do things exactly the way God says do it. That's exactly where we are. Tonight's message is about God has a standard that he wants us to live by. And tonight we're going to talk about a plumb line. Anybody know what a plumb line is? Yeah, I thought some of you did. And God, yes. Uh, a plumb line, it goes down and it gives you a good starting place. I mean, you know, when you, when you have a place to start, you can build a, a foundation. But as you begin to grow and as it begins to come up, if you're not careful, you'll get out of out of, out, of, out, of, out of sync. You'll, you'll, you'll mess up a little bit. It don't take much. I know someone who built a house and they pulled the foundation and they measured, but on one side of the foundation they had it right, but on the other side they had it to the, out, to the inside of the brick instead of the outside and they were, they were eight inches off all the way across and they had, done, done, they had to tear the brick down and do it over again. <laughs> Can you imagine? And, and, and that's a mess up. Uh, you ever done that, Larry? Okay, we're going to go on. <laughs> One time, that's all it took to learn, right? Listen, now where we are, and I don't know the message this morning and where we are, we're growing as a church, and church, Union 3 and I, I have, I have been in a growing church at Mount Zion, but I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, there's some things that we're experiencing right now that I don't know I've ever been here before. So we need to be careful about what we do and how we do it. And as we begin to grow from the foundation, we may come up to a place, and there may come to a place where we realize we've got to tear back down and start at the foundation again. We have to be very careful about how we do and what we do. And, be very, and, and God has a plumb line, which means he has a standard. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 7, we're going to begin reading in verse 11. If you would, let's stand for the reading of God's word. You love Jesus tonight? Say amen. amen. If you love me tonight, say amen. amen. All right, I'm fixing to preach. Y'all ready? Here we go. I believe the word of God. I, the word of God. I, trust, in I trust in God's promises to mold me, mold me. to strengthen me, Strength. to encourage me, Strength. to save me, Strength. and to send me. Amen. Today I will listen. Today I will, listen. Today I will learn. Today I will learn. The scripture says Solomon has just finished the temple. Chapter 7, verse 11. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own <laughs> house. I love it. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven... And there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let's pray. Father, I pray you come in power right now. Father, you, you work in our hearts and you help us to be the church that you want us to be. Not the one we want to be, but the God that the one you want us to be. So Father God, I pray 
that you help us to understand exactly what your standard is and what you want from us when it comes to holiness and righteousness. Father, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, since the beginning of Scripture, we see from the creation to the cross. Since the beginning of Scripture, God's always had a standard. Let me give you some examples. Adam and Eve was to tend the garden, but they were not to eat of this tree. Abraham was to go to a land, and God says, you go to a land and I will show you. Noah was to build an ark, and God gave him the exact, precise measurements and dimension of that ark that he was supposed to build. He wasn't supposed to fabricate it himself and change some things where he'd like it here or like it there. God gave him the exact dimensions that he was supposed to have. David wanted everything in him. He wanted to build a temple. He wanted to do it. And God told him, no, it's not your place to build a temple. Solomon's going to build the temple. David wasn't happy about that. I think he struggled with that. But the fact of the matter is, that was not God's will for his life. And there were some struggles in David's life, honestly, that prevented that. And, 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 and when you see, God has a standard. So everything that God has instructed was commanded by his standard. Church, today we're still under God's mandate of grace, which means his grace is sufficient. Which means everything that's happened from creation to the cross, everything you see about how he, he treated the nation of Israel and led them out of Egypt, but the plagues that was cast, the things that when they went in the wilderness and, 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 and the, 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 the people just could not get into a spirit of obedience, they become, a, they become grumblers is what I call them. And they were never pleased with their freedom. They were never pleased with anything. Every time they had a little discomfort, they always, claimed, they always, they always grumbled to God. I'm going to tell you something. You better not ever get to that place in your life where every time something's wrong, you grumble to God. You can pray on Him. You can humble yourself. But you start grumbling to God, and God will turn a deaf ear to you. He's not listening to that. We're, we're to go to him in reverence. But everything God did through David, through, through Jonah, through Amos, through all these things, God did it to protect what grace that we have today. Everything, there was a reason, there's a standard. Church, God has given us a standard to live by, and that standard is his grace and his power through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's what we're supposed to do. We're not, it's not our job to water it down. It's not our job to make it easy. It's not our job to try to recreate something that God never intended. If you look at the history, history always repeats itself. There's always a religious crowd that wants to recreate something that God said. They want to let down on the rules. They want to quit doing this and quit doing this. Praise God, we're going to do it the way God says. Amen? And that's the way. Y'all with me tonight? Y'all with me? Amen? Okay, now y'all hang on. We're fixing to get crunk up again so y'all get ready, okay? Now, it says, number one, he says, he's going to show us three things tonight. Number one, God has a plumb line. I want you to go to Amos. You go close to Jonah. It's right to the left of Jonah. And I'm going to give you a minute to find Amos. Amos is hidden. He's in the prophets, but he's kind of hidden. It'll take you a minute to find it. It's on page 1013. <laughs> Y'all get that in a minute. Uh, Amos, this is very powerful scripture right here because Amos speaks of a plumb line. And he's, God's speaking to him, but he's talking about it in a vision. And God is, is using this analogy of a plumb line to prove that, listen... You are going to be held to a high, the nation of Israel is going to be held to a high standard. I'm not letting up, I'm not giving up, and I'm going to tell you, he, and he makes it very clear. I'm just reading the part in uh, chapter 7 of Amos, verse 7 and 8. When you get there, say amen. Now, everything God has instructed has been commanded by His standard, Okay? And, 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 and it's so important. Now, verse 7 says, And thus he showed me, behold, the Lord stood on a wall. The word wall here is another word for heart. When you, get, when you break this verse down, you'll see something. Made with a plumb line, with a, made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. That means the Lord is the one that's checking to see. Uh, and, and, and the Lord said to me, Amos... What do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. 
That means God is, look at this, and the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid to waste, and I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. Church, don't you hear my heart? Now, what I'm talking about tonight is just talking about us, but I need, I'm on, when you go to Europe and you go to these places that only 1% uh, are pro- professing Christians today, that used to be the place where the Word of God was the strongest. And what happened? The people just got a little bit off kilter. They, they started going to, to uh, um, what we know as Calvinism. They started going to this believing that you were predestined. You had no responsibilities whatsoever. And they just became to believe all of this, this uh, false truth. It's just not true. And when you begin to believe that and you begin to live that way, it starts just shutting. Now the churches are museums. And now they're dead. And now, because once you think it's just not your responsibility to be passionate and go out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, friend, I'm going to tell you something, it just destroys you. Now, even though that's an example of truth, it can easily happen right here. It's so easy for us to say, well, we don't have to do, well, we don't have to, I'm going to tell you something, we need to do everything that God says we need to do in his word. It is not burdensome. It is not overbearing. It is not too much on us. It is not. It, everything you discover in God's word should be a blessing to you. It should be a blessing to you. And if you ever get to the place that you discover something in God's word and it seems burdensome to you, you need to go to God in a spirit of prayer and you need to check out what's wrong with your heart. Now, he goes on. He says, number one, God has a plumb line. And here's the truth. Uh, This reveals where to start and keeps you in line as you build. That's what a plumb line does. But it says God's got a standard. What's his standard? The Word of God. This is the standard. Who's the Word of God? His name is Jesus. When you talk about the Word of God, the Word of God is Jesus. From Genesis 1 all the way through the Word of God. That's who he is. He is the plumb line. He's te- he tells us, he teaches us, he, he, he ascended, he went to heaven, he's at the right hand of the Father. So he sent back his spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, just like we talked about this morning, convicts us. When he convicts us of sin, that he teaches us why he has convicted us. When he teaches us, then he leads us. In all things, he will bring to remembrance all things that we need to remember. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But God has a standard. In verse 11, when you go back to 2 Chronicles, you begin to see that Solomon finished the house of the Lord. And God hears our prayers, and God always had a temple. Every time you look and you see, the purpose of God was to always have a temple, whether it's in the wilderness or whether it's in Jerusalem. God always planned to have a temple. And to think of it now, since we have a high priest and his name is Jesus, we are God's temple. We are supposed to be his house. We are supposed to be putting things in order. God has a standard for your temple. God did not create you to to live life any different than than, than what he says. And and I touched on this Wednesday night. And since my young people are in there, God created you um, to save yourself for marriage. He did not create you to have sex outside of marriage. And adults need to figure that out when they've been divorced and they're trying to date somebody again and they get it in their mind. They're going to try somebody out. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to destroy your next relationship. God did not create us to be holy and in the have, and, and, and in the, and, and in the have that kind of, uh, of activity in our life. He wants us to be holy. And he wants it to do like, listen, if, you were to, if we'd do things the right way, we wouldn't be experiencing the mess in our life that we're experiencing. Young people, I'm telling you, when you, you have a relationship, when you have it, God created you to have innocence in your life. He created you to be that way. And, and it's like I said, um, and this is a good example. I said Wednesday night, you show me a guy who has looked at something when he was 8, 10 years old, and he'll still remember the picture of the girl that he's seen. You'll still remember that image that's in your head. Why? Because God didn't. God created us to be protected. Sometimes your parents, it should be all the time, but our parents are supposed to be godly people. They're supposed to protect. That means they're fighting for your innocence. All the times they may say, well, you're not ready to date. Praise God, I agree with them. 
I, I, I don't think you should date until you act like you're old enough to date. I don't care if you're 25. If, you don't, if you're a 25-year-old and you act like a 10-year-old every time you're told no, then praise God, lock them in the room and put a door in a hole and you can feed them. Amen? But do not let people out who are immature. Listen, all it takes is, 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 all it takes is just a moment. And everything about your child's innocence is gone. And God did not create you to have to endure that. Now, I'll tell you something. God created you that, that, that when you're married and you have that person and you're married with and, 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 and on that wedding night that, that, that you follow through and, and a good follow through is just a good way to say this. And, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Amen. <laughs> yeah, amen. And that's good for the camera. Amen. Uh, but I keep saying amen a lot here, uh, <laughs> but y'all are getting excited, way excited out here. But what I love about this is the point that if you will go into a marriage that way, young people, that when you get to the place that you're 65 years old and you're married to the person that you met when you was 29 years old, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But when you, and you see that person as a 65-year-old, you see them as a 20-year-old. Because your mind is not tarnished by some picture you've seen in a magazine. And it's not tarnished by something you've seen that you wasn't supposed to see. Because God allowed true love, true love really exists. If you believe that, say amen. And that means God has created someone for everyone. And, and unless you want to become a monk. Me, I'm not, I'm not monk material. Amen. I'm not, I'm not. I got my woman and I'm proud of it. And, <laughs> amen. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I love my wife. But the thing of it is... We had a lot of struggles in our marriage, and we had a lot of things go wrong. We had a lot of things go right. When I was in high school, there's just a lot of, I, I was just, I, there's just a lot of things I wish I could do different, but I can't. But I can tell you this, we made it through. And the prize of that in making it through is, is the way I look at my wife. I still look at my wife the way I did when she was 16 years old. I remember what she looked like when she was 14 years old. We were, well... We wasn't dating, but we was riding on the bus trying to sneak sugar, amen? And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. I remember me, I'd never done that before, and I was nervous as a cat. I can still remember the seat I was sitting in. I remember the place we was at. There was a light there. I remember everything about it, honey, my first sugar. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was you, wasn't it, honey? <laughs> well she's looking at me like she don't know what I'm talking about you were there too she's not remembering this stuff okay 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 here's a here's here's my point okay here's my point don't sneak no sugar and tell nobody about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's get back on the plumb line because I just plumb got off of this thing. Okay. Is it hot in here or is it just y'all? <laughs> God hears our prayer and God always has a temple. So God can see our sin and he, and he did not bless when that line is not where it needs to be. If we in our relationship get somewhere we do not need to be, God can't bless it. That's not a good place to be. Especially if you're in ministry, especially if you understand teaching, especially if you understand things. But when you get to that place and, 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 and you've got out of plumb where God's telling you you need to be, God has to step back. You see, that's why he, he designed the church. He designed the church so if we see one of our brothers and our sisters that get just a little bit out of the way, God necessarily is not going to be the one. God has the plumb line, and he gives us the plumb line, and it tells us we're supposed to go to our brothers and sisters, and we're supposed to carefully and patiently pull them back. 
It, Jude one twenty two, just like it says, those who doubt show mercy. God has a plan, but we have to be very careful about the way that we need, we need, to, we need to pay attention to each other. We need accountability to each other. And we need to make sure that we're growing the right, right way. Now, verse 12, and then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. You know, God's house has always been designed to be a house of sacrifice. Why? Because he wants to teach us the high cost of sin. He wants to teach us that if we ought to have a repentant heart. If we've done something, and, and, and if you've done something outside and you're right with God, God's going to convict your heart tonight that there's something in your life. There's something you've said. There's something you've done. There's something that's wrong there. That, that God, the Holy Spirit's going to convict you of that. And when he convicts you of that, now he's, you have a responsibility to do something. But he wants to teach us the high cost. David wanted to build a temple, but Solomon is the one. And you know, and this is what I thought. God's will trumps everything we want. It does. What's God's will for this church? God's will for this church, just like any church. God's will is to grow. But God's will is not for anyone to get famous. And God's will is not for anybody else to get the glory except him. Amen? So the plumb line. The plumb line. If we get up, what happens if the wall... What, what, if, what if we stay so closely in tune with one another that we can help each other to catch it when we put the next block up and we see us a little off? Listen, and listen, you should grow to maturity to the place that when God's plumb line is used, you don't get your feelings hurt when somebody says, listen, if you keep on building on that right there... You're going to have to tear your wall down and you're going to have to start again. Praise God for people who will sit around and have the discernment, have spiritual discernment, and they can tell when something's wrong or tell when something's going the wrong direction. Like guys, what, what is insanity? It's thinking that you can do what you've always done and expect different results. That is not going to happen. It may, you, can, you can talk the talk. You can sound like everything's okay. But brother, you're headed to the same train wreck that you did before. It's not going to change. The only thing that's going to change our life is if we do things God's way. God is setting us up to pray for a nation. God is setting us up to pray for generations that has not even been born yet. And he's telling us we've got to be careful about the foundation that we are building on and what we're doing. Why? Because one day none of us in this building are going to be here. We're not even going to exist. The people who established this church in 1836, they're not around. But they did it and God used them. So what's going to happen in the next hundred years? Pray, hopefully Jesus comes back. Amen? I'm ready. I mean, I'm, I'm ready for him to come back now. If, if Jesus comes back tonight, I feel like it, I have, I, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I really do. Is there things in my life I'm working on? There will never be a time in your life that you're not working on something. Okay? Now, Dave, listen, God, in verse 13, he says, And when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. God cannot bless sin. God protects obedience, but God disciplines disobedience. It's very simple. If we want God's blessing on us, we need to be obedient. If we want God's discipline on us, we need to, we'll be disobedient. But wherever we are, God's going to discipline. You, it doesn't matter how you act or what you respond. You can be the most loving people in this church. But when you're outside those doors and you're being disobedient, when you walk in here, God can't bless disobedience. He is not going to enable you no more than you would enable your child to do something that you know would hurt them. He's going to do what's best for us. He's going to teach us. He's going to show us. And I, I don't know about you, but this is where I am. And you pray about this and you tell, I, I would like for you to join me in this. I, I study churches. I have for a long time. When I came here, I studied churches in, in uh, probably the state of Alabama. Okay, bring it here. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but we, man, somebody was good at hiding that one. Come on. No. <laughs> But I study churches, and what I did, I'm finding out churches who grew. And when they grew, what happened to them? Why? What happened to the decline? What caused it? Uh, and, and I've learned a lot. 
And what, some of the things I've learned is what happens is, is when you get people coming in, the leadership gets laxed. They get laxed. And, and, and they, begin, they begin to say, well, we got the crowd here. We can just, no, absolutely not. You can't do that. Your church will never grow past this leadership. Never. If the leadership stops growing, every church that has, that has failed, every church that has declined, declined because of the leadership. Every single one of them. And that's why we have a standard here. God has a standard that we're supposed to do things the right way and keep on pursuing Him in everything. And I don't know about you, but it's a scary place to be at a place where you're vulnerable. It's the only way I know how to put it. You're vulnerable. Because, you, you know, there's no absolutes, but you know God's blessing this Sunday. And I pray, God, please don't take your hand off of me next Sunday. It's, I'm totally dependent and totally trustworthy because, I, you know, we're all capable of doing something we don't need to do. And you need to protect that. You need to protect. Listen, any one person in this room tonight, you can do something in your life and sin and just totally stop what God's doing in our church. And we don't want that. So what we do is we need to stay close enough and, and, and don't call it judging, you call it loving that when we see somebody building on top of something that's getting to get a little out of, out of, out of, out of line, then we say, listen, don't, I don't want you to go that far and have to tear this whole thing down again. I want to stop you where you are. And let me help you. I'll help you take that brick. I'll help you mix the mortar. I'll help you do all the work we need to do. I'll get new blocks. I'll do whatever it takes. I just don't want you to get to your part of the life and you feel like everything you've done and everything you built on is wrong. So you start over. And isn't that the amazing thing about grace? You see, God has a plumb line, and that plumb line is for the purpose that we don't go too far without finding where we're supposed to be. Number two, God has a plan. In this text, he says temple. That's all he uses is temple. He, he goes from the truth to the temple, and God wants us to call on him. You know, if my people who are called by my name, all of the word of God is to lead people to redemption. When we are in revival, it prepares our hearts to call on God and gives a burden for the lost. Guys, the reason churches start declining is they lose their burden for the lost. And, 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 and sometimes when there's things that go on, and, and, and church, this is, I want us to kind of get to this place and pray about this. And many of y'all have experiences in this. You've been in other places, and you've seen the ups and the downs and the struggles. And you know what, I, this is what I, I'm going to be honest. This is what I love about coming to Union 3 from Mount Zion. And I served there as a student pastor and a mission pastor. And I was there for a long time, served in ministry. But I had a chance for a fresh start. I'd made so many mistakes. Now, don't get me wrong. People love me. I baptized people left and right, brother. I was leading people to the Lord. There was, God didn't move me because I wasn't effective. God moved me because it was time. There's never a time in your ministry where you get where you're not effective anymore. If you're not effective, that's because of sin. It ain't got nothing, that's nothing else. You're just, you just got sin in your life. You need to get rid of it. So God brought me here. Now there's things that I wish, I wish would I had a call to joy when I was doing student ministry. I'd have gave anything. If I'd have had that, I'm telling you, I'm just thinking that was my struggle. That was my weakness. When I, when I came to Union, I was, and, and, and God taught me, said, well, I'm going to stay here a year, and we just need to find out, I mean, you got some fine people in this church, and just love on people, and just watch. Okay, God, what you going to do? And just be patient, and just let him work, and let him work. And he just begins to reveal the giftedness of people that was in this church. And you sit, and you study it, and you see, why did God put this one here? Why did God put this one here? You see, God's people has always his plan to stay together. The nation of Israel just never could get that in their head. They was always trying to go against God. They was, they'd go with God. God would do something amazing for them. He would deliver them from the Pharaoh. He would, do something, he would feed them manna from heaven. Constantly he would do things. And the next time they would turn around and they would just shake their fist at him. Church, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to make a commitment that we're going to praise God when things are right. And we're going to praise God when we're in the storms. We're going to praise God, period. And if we'll have the heart to just do that, God will send the storms for spiritual growth instead of correction. Amen? So, God has a plan. 
Now, now listen to this. Why did Jonah, why, on Jonah, why did God send a storm? Why did God send a captain? Why did God send a fish? Because God had a plan to redeem his people, even a wicked city like Nineveh. God has a plan to win the lost. God has a plan for the city of Hoax Bluff. God has a, I'm going to tell you, God's plan for the city of Hoax Bluff is to tear down religious activity. That's God's plan. And you have to stay steady, and God has a plan for ball play. You know what that plan is? It's to totally just start here and go all the way to the back and just go ahead and just get rid of drugs and alcohol. How do you do that? Win people to Jesus. You can put them in every kind of step study, and, or not step study, but the, seven, the, uh, was it the 12 steps? That you have the 12 steps, and, and, and you go... Step studies based on scripture, and, and when you go, God speaks to you in that, and, and you have your relationship with God. But with all these other things that's out there, nothing's going to change your community. It's going to take them getting their heart right with God. I, there was a day that nobody thought Jessica Haney would ever live right. How do I know that? Because I talked to people in the deputies, <laughs> I talked to judges, I've talked to people, and this is what they say. I can't believe she changed. Well, I can. You're sitting right in front of me. <laughs> Amen? Now, now, but, but that's the thing. So if God can do that in Jessica, and God can do what he did in me, and God can do what he can do, did in you, then why can't he do it for anybody else? You see, God has a plumb line, and that plumb line's not based on Who's who is who? He, he doesn't have a certain crowd that he set aside. Well, these are my special people. Uh uh. No, his special people are those who will repent of sin. And his special people are those who will cry out in my name. Amen. So we see Jonah. Jonah started building right, but then he got off plumb. He, 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 he was his prophet. He was, he was so in tune with God that God spoke to him about where he was supposed to go. But he knew the reputation of that city and he didn't want to go. That was too hard. But you see, God told him to go. So, so when he, he began to take, take of his own, and I'm going to tell you something. It's a sweet place. You know, Jonah, let me tell you, uh, Jonah's like this. Jonah is like that, that kid that's been in church and he grew up in church all his life. And he was saved at the age of eight years of age. And he's never been out in the world. He's never seen sin. He's never seen any of those things. He just grew up in church. He was in church nine months before his, before his mama gave birth. Amen? That's one of those kids. Listen, kids, I, teenagers, young men, young women. Amen? I'm getting it right. But when you grow up, there is a world out there you have no idea about. Landon? You got good hair, man. I am so jealous. When you get in the world and you go to a college or whatever you're going to do, there is such wickedness out there. I remember when I started driving an 18-wheeler and going on the road, and I'd still, I, I, I remember my first time I had to drive a car in Anniston, Alabama. I do. I remember that. I was so countryfied, I very seldom ever drove to town. I stayed in the country all the time. But I remember. And then when I started traveling all over the United States and started seeing what's out there, brother, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and some of you guys know it in this room, there is some wicked, wicked, messed up people that's in this world. They're evil. They are demon possessed. They're just waiting on you guys to get out there and be gullible and think you can change somebody. And they're just going to they're going to eat your lunch. Jonah was just like that kid that's always been in church, never been outside. So he just thought, well, I'm just going to go do my own thing. Well, he did, and God didn't like it. And when God got a hold of him, he put him on the, he, he sent a captain to him. He was on this ship. He went down. He, he sent a fish when they threw him overboard that captured him. Why? Because God was bigger than his disobedience. Now, I'm telling you, you serve a God tonight that he is bigger. We're going to make mistakes, and we're going to mess up. We're going to say things we don't need to say, and we're going to do things we don't need to do. 
But the fact of the matter is, we should not be doing the sin that we repented of when we were saved. It comes different. When, now, God has a plan. And, and, and God has a plumb line by which to compare our decisions. And God's plumb line is a picture of God's righteousness and His divine will. Now, in Amos 7, 8, when it comes down to divine will of God, He does not play or overlook or trying, or excuses. And guys, listen, when you understand God's sovereignty, and you understand His divine will, He, 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 loves, he loves where you, He loves your home. God loves your home. God loves your family. God loves your children. But God has a divine will, and He needs you to get in line with what that will is. Today, what we see in our society is we try to use grace as a reason of why we don't have to do what God says he's told us to do. I see it all the time. I hear it all the time. It's almost like we use the altar to, op- to, to, to insult God's grace sometimes. And we'll come up and we'll, we, we have an opportunity to pray and repent. And what we do is we keep on the same thing and the same thing and the same thing. When the thing of it is, it's not about our prayer, it's about our surrender. It's about our heart. And God wants us to completely, why? He has this plumb line, but He wants us to live. God's plan is so perfect and that's why each of us is here tonight. God had a perfect plan of how to get grace from creation all the way to Calvary. And then how to get Calvary, the grace from Calvary, all the way to the day Jesus comes back. God has a perfect plan and we are involved in the midst of it. I praise God he didn't let up on Israel. And I praise God he didn't give in and lighten the load. I praise God that he has a standard. And if he hadn't had a standard, there wouldn't be no sense in us trying to worship in spirit and truth. He met the woman at the well and he said, one day my people will worship in spirit and truth. What does that mean? That we're in here because of God's mercy, man. We're here because of his grace and his power. And grace cannot be diluted by you, but you can dilute grace in your life. You can't can't mess up what God has done, but we can interfere. We're supposed to be a light. Think about it. Take, Take the big picture. So, so you think about the church and the way it struggles and the way it, it, it hinders. The church can hinder people. Listen, where we are right now, people are waiting on us. Well, let's just see if they continue. Well, if we don't continue, then we're all a bunch of liars. God says continue in my word. Does he not? We are supposed to abide in him and we're supposed to continue in him. And by the way, I've, been, I've already, once I've tasted God's grace, brother, I'm, I'm addicted Woo! <laughs> Amen. I'm addicted, and I love it, and I don't want anything less. This is what I see. Now listen, God's plan is so perfect, but God's began reaching you in Genesis, and He did not. He didn't let Abraham mess up. He didn't let Noah mess up. He didn't let David mess up. He didn't let Moses mess up, and He didn't let Jonah mess up. And God loves you so much. He don't want to let us mess up. Sometimes I think that where we are, church, I sometimes I don't know if we really understand how good God's been to us. We get busy in the work. We get busy with Celebrate Recovery. We get busy with our step study. We get busy in our DT classes. We get busy in our Bible study. We get busy preparing messages. We get busy. All this stuff, we're busy. We're, we're busy with, a, praise God for the men's conference, but the night the men's conference was done, Sunday was coming. And it's time to move on. You can't, you can't grow celebrating in the past. You can only celebrate in the future. So what we do is, what's next? Now, we need to realize, I mean, I mean, God has just so blessed us. And, and listen, people's going to come and people's going to go. I, I pray that people come and just love our church and want to stay and want to serve. But the truth of the matter is, that's not always going to happen. When we're preaching truth and you're living truth and we want to raise up missionaries, church, I want everybody in our church to be a missionary. Whether it's across the street or whether it's across the sea. I want everybody in our church to have a heart to be a missionary. I want you to have a heart to want to feed people and to love people and to share the gospel with people. I want you to have that heart. Don't let anything interfere with you with that. That's God's plan for our church. And when our church, when, I, when we get together in that kind of unity, 
man, God, God's going to show us his plumb line. He's not going to excuse. He say, well, one's a little out of line. God said, well, maybe that one's going to be okay. No, okay, don't get into heaven. It's not okay. We have to do things God's way. Period. Period. And, and, and it's, not about, it's not personal. It's not about how you feel. It's not about what your opinion, not what you think. We just need to do things God's way. Amen? Number three, God has a people. God has a plumb line, God has a plan, and God has a people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, God's commands will always lead to the redemption of people in the future. People without a vision, what? If we don't have a vision for the future, you don't have anything. And, and, and God, everything that God's doing in our life right now is for the future. Everything he's doing. Lynn, where's your grandbaby going to go to church at? Where are they going to worship at in spirit and truth where they give an invitation? Where are they going to be in classes where they can get in the Word of God and, and people that, or somebody hold them in a nursery that really loves them and cares about them? Listen, I know there's so many churches out there that's so good, there's so many around, but we're not responsible for all them other churches. We're responsible for this one. And that means everything that we do, we need to have our integrity, have God's integrity through us. That we do things the right way. We are his people. That means we are his representative on this earth while we live. And people are watching and they're listening and they're, and they're grading. They're, they're seeing and... and, and uh... Todd, can I share your story? You okay? <clears throat> Todd's been witnessing to this guy at work. And, and he's not a believer. And they, he had to go to Chattanooga to, uh, to put in this time clock. And for some reason or another, they couldn't get it to work. They tried everything. And it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't function right. So they finally became so frustrated. And, they, and him and this other guy, they rode all the way to Chattanooga together. So I imagine there's conversations. There's, he's being Jesified all over the place. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but he, he, they, they went to lunch, and Todd said, listen, guys. He said, if you don't mind, I, need to, I want to bless the food. They said, absolutely. Todd blessed the food. And he said, Lord, we are so just, we're, we just can't figure his clock out. Would you fix his clock? He prayed it in his prayer. Well, he said, amen. They went back to the place where they was working on the clock at, and it was working. He called the people, and he said, man, did you do something? No, I didn't do nothing. I was waiting on you to call me, and I hadn't heard from you. He asked this other guy, did y'all do anything? No, I didn't do anything. You say, well, why did God do that? Well, he prayed and asked God to do it. What are some of the things in your life tonight that if you would just ask God, but you got to do it with a clean heart now. If you have a, if you have a, a mind that's, that is, uh, if you, <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to have a clean heart. It interferes. It's in Scripture. It's in Scripture. They were going back home, and that guy that was riding with him looked at him, and he said, man, do you realize you prayed for that, and it worked? He said, that was weird. <laughs> you know what that tells me? When that guy has a struggle in his life, he's coming to Todd. That's the kind of example we need to be. We need to be that example. And I'm going to tell you, it took a lot of, you know, I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? It just not worked, right? But it did. And I appreciate you having the faith. That you got to have faith to pray that kind of prayer. And he did. Man, that's awesome, isn't it? Not. But you know, that's what God's called. We are, I am, God, I'm, I'm my people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If my people who are called by my name will do what? Will humble themselves. 
You know, the wall is another word for the word heart when you break it down in the text. God looks at the heart of his people. He checks all the way down to our foundation. And since the day we started walking with God, sometimes we have to ask the question, God, have I got a little off track? And it's easy to do. I remember when I was a new Christian, I was so excited, and I began to grow and do some things. And sometimes in tendencies in your life, you just, have a, you just want to back off a little bit. Well, I just need me a little break. I'm just going to back off a little bit. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to warn you. You better be careful about doing that. You think you can just step back up where you was? No, you won't. When God has brought you to the place that he is using you in a mighty way, here I am, Lord, send me. Let that be your daily prayer. Here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord. I can, I can handle more, God. Come on. <laughs> yeah, send me. Expand my territory. Bless me indeed. For, protect me from evil, God. Prayer of Jabez. And that's what you prayed. But don't you, st- I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you step back when God's telling you to step up and you're going to feel like you got sucker punched. Don't do it. Everything, what happens? You open the door for the devil in your home. No, that don't mean you're going to get attacked, but it means your kids will. Don't do it. That's where we are tonight. God has blessed us, and we are seeing a sense of revival in our church. That means while we're here, we need to pay attention, and we need to stay focused. This is serious business. When When the Word of God is open... You need to pay attention and you need to stay awake. This morning, I had about three people just struggling to stay awake. It was all I could do not to go back there and throw my Bible at them. I'm just being honest. Man, I had prepared. I was passionate about this word. And it just makes you want to quit when you see people. And I know sometimes people are on medication. And I know there's a battle going on up here just like there's a battle going on out there. I know it. Don't take it personal. I'm just venting, okay? But sometimes when that happens, you're just saying, man, am I actually putting people to sleep? You know what I'm saying? I mean, all these things go through your head and you're thinking this thing while you're trying not to mess up your words. And, and, but you think that. But I'm going to tell you something. When you watch people in God's house or when you preach a message like I preached this morning and people in this church come up and say, Brother, I loved it. Man, I didn't know if it was coming up. Tell me. I didn't know what they was going to say to me. You know what I'm saying? But, but God, I thank you for your heart. Thank you for that heart to want the preaching of the word. And thank you that you love God convicting you about something. That shows a mature church. And I appreciate that. But you see, now we ought to realize it all starts and it all stops with me. It all starts and it all stops with you. What is this church going to look like in the next 10 years if you keep on living the life like you're living right now? What's your plans, students? What's your plans? To how do you want God to use you? Can I give you a little advice? If you'll pray about what you want God to do in your life, I promise you he'll send the love of your life. But if you pray for the love of your life over what God wants you to do with your life, you're going to get what the devil wants you to have. I promise you. But if you're obedient and you just say, God, I'm just going to line up in your will, it don't mean you can't have butterflies from time to time. It doesn't mean you can't have this puppy love and stuff. I'm not saying all that. I'm not saying you can't enjoy being a teenager. I'm just saying don't put somebody else in front of God. Don't do that. If there's a lot of us in this room, if we could go back, we would say, Lord, I wish I could have known these things at that time. We didn't know. Nobody taught us. So, let me wrap up. God's command just to do three things. Number one, humble yourself. How do you humble yourself? Draw close to God. He will draw close to you. Don't take credit for the things that only God can do. And and, and don't get in his way. Church, right now, when people ask, Brother Joy, what are you doing out of Union 3? I'm just trying to stay out of his way. I don't want to mess it up. I'm just trying to stay out of his way. I'm so excited about our trip. We leave Saturday, right? I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around, man. I've got a busy week this week, speaking in Montgomery, 
uh, just different things that's going on this week. And I am, I'm honored. Don't get me wrong. I'm honored. But my mind is so focused on this trip that I'm so ready to go and, and to see what God's going to do. Because I know he's going to do something. I can feel that tension. I can feel the tension. And, uh, son, it's going to get good. You know what I'm saying? I love it. It's almost like it, it, I, I love it. But I think now, and we're going to pray about that at the end of the service. God commands us to be humble. God commands us to pray and seek my face. Uh, this reveals our way to revival and our purpose for revival. God, God, we, need to, we need to pray and seek God's face. Tonight with my guys in a call to growth, we were talking about praying and how sincere we need to be in praying and calling on the name. And what's the benefits? Why do we have an opportunity to do it? Because you have a high priest that was nailed to a cross. He shed every drop of his blood. They put him in a tomb. He rose again on the third day. And you have a mediator that you can share your heart with God and he'll listen to you. Isn't that amazing? Pray and seek his face. And the last thing is turn from our wicked ways. Stop what the plumb line reveals in your life. What has got a little out of kilter? What in your life is just leaning to that edge? It is not exactly where it needs to. And listen, you'll never be a day in your life that you don't, you're not growing closer. There's not a day in your life that God's not going to challenge you to change something in your life. He's going to convict you. He's going to confront you. He, <clears throat> I want to read this. Here's the point. Why should we have a desire to turn, to humble ourselves and to pray? Why do we need to do this? Because God wants, so God can hear us. God is, will, God is wanting to bless his kids. He wants to give to you. He wants you to have. Not for the purpose of so you can have a new car. Not for the purpose so you can have a big bank account. I hear those guys get on the radio and preach this prosperity gospel. I want to drive up there and just, you know what I'm saying? If cross of Calvary does not make you rich, friend, I'm telling you, you have missed the mark. You have eternal life. And you can ask God, God, would you bless me and bless me indeed? God, would you help me, help me to pay my bills? God, would you pray protection over my children? Would you protect them when they go to school? Would you be with a bus driver while they're driving? God, would you protect my wife while she's out driving and while she's out shopping? God, would you? And, and listen, this is what I shared with the guys tonight. We were talking about how we pray and what we do. This is the way I pray. First, my prayer is personal. I'm praising God. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you I'm not in a truck today. Thank you that you, my life is completely different. Thank you that you led me to Union 3. Thank you that I'm seeing you just move and do amazing things. And then my prayer becomes powerful. Powerful, I begin to petition God. God, I need to pray for this one that God has laid on my heart. And God, I pray for this one that's laid on my heart. God, I pray for this one that's laid on my heart. And I petition him. But then I have purposeful prayer. Purposeful prayer is I'm praying while I'm preaching this message. I pray all the time. I'm driving. I'm walking. I'm, I'm looking. I'm pr my life is constantly prayer from the time I get up to the time I go to sleep. Constantly. I can sit and watch the movie I can only imagine. And watching that movie impacted, I think it impacted my wife's life as much as it impacted my life because it took us back to some things in our past. I was listening over there, and boy, she was just, yeah. I was trying to hold it in. I was trying to be a man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was trying to hold it in. And uh, every now and then, I'd go, you know. And, 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 but I'm telling you, you go, you better carry you a hanky. You better carry you a snot rag, brother. I'm going to tell you, it's more than a hanky. Uh, but that is a powerful movie, a powerful movie about how God transformed, how he can bring forgiveness and how he created you to do something amazing with your life. Do you realize that? He created you to do something amazing. Phil Blair, when you was whooping people around ball play when you was in your 20s, nobody ever thought you'd be going to the Napo River to share the gospel. And spotlighting deer. I don't even have to ask him. And Jay Beggs, you're another story, man. This is the invitation. I can't even get on Jay Beggs right now. God has a plumb line, and he's blessed us. So let's do this. We start rocket science.
If we're going to do something, let's just do God's way. And let's don't ever get off the mark. And every now and then, let's check ourselves. God, is there anything in me that's offensive to you? That would be a good thing to pray tonight. God, is there anything in me that's offensive to you? And is there anybody in this place you've never truly surrendered your heart and life to Jesus? Then tonight would be a good night for you to do that. Amen? Let's pray.